Hello, folks. It's uh, 2 o'clock here Eastern, and I see our uh, CEO, Glenn Nye, is uh, joining us as well. So thank you uh, for joining us. We'll have a few other folks uh, starting to come on as well, joining the attendees. But I'll turn it over to Glenn now for some initial welcoming remarks. Uh, thank you, Dan. And I've got my mute off here, so thank you. Uh for your uh, for your welcome, and I I will apologize in advance if there's any noise on my end. There's a construction project going on at the house next door, so uh, such are the tribulations of working from home in the COVID era. But Ben, thank you so much for being with us, and um, and we appreciate you sharing your time with us today, um, and to talk to us about Operation Secondary Infection, and a topic that is very important um, in today's political context today's national security context and one um, that the center has spent some effort focusing on um, over the past several months, particularly as we began to uh, look at our national security program portfolio this year in the frame of great powers competition, um, trying to analyze the, the newly uh, developing relationship between the United States and China and Russia on the world stage um, but also as an organization that studies the relationship between the presidency and Congress and the, the nature of the relationship between um, those institutions and the American citizenry and on trying to understand how our politics uh, has reached a, a low in terms of polarization. Um, I think a low in terms of um, just the carrying out of our public dialogue and as an institution that tries to facilitate a better functioning federal government so we can achieve our national security aims and foster an understanding of both the international and the domestic context that feeds into that. Ben, your topic is very interesting for our work. And so, again, I want to thank you for being with us. Um, we will invite attendees, of course, to participate uh, in the discussion as usual using the Q&A function um, at the bottom of the screen, or um, if you want to open the participants panel and raise your digital hand. Um, we will recognize you after giving Ben an opportunity to provide uh, some opening comments, some thoughts about Operation Secondary Infection. Um, ben, we'd, we'd love to hear um, a little bit of the background, wh why you took this project on, You know what went into the project and the work, and what are the top takeaways for us um, as a group of people seeking to further um, the, the better functioning of the U.S. government and the protection of American national security through a, a deeper understanding of our adversaries in the world. So with that, Ben, let me turn it over to you and thank you again for, uh, for joining. I'm proud to have you on the, on the center's webcast today and uh, I'll, I'll turn it right over to you, Ben. Ben, that's great. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to be there remotely from very, very rainy Scotland right now. Um, so I, I've got a slide deck which I'll show in a minute, but just for, for context, I'm currently the Director of Investigations at Graphica, which is a New York-based social media analytics company, uh, and I'm an external um, non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. And in both, those, um, in both those jobs, I've been involved for the last five years in trying to dig out some of the information operations, the influence operations that are running online. And part of that work has been building a relationship with the with the tech platforms. And one of the things which has happened is we, we're now in a situation where before the platforms do a takedown, they will actually share some information that they are legally allowed to share with external researchers before they do the takedown. So we're in a situation where we can sometimes get leads from one platform saying, hey, we think we found something. And as external researchers, what we can then do is say, well, well thank you for that. We're going to look across all the other platforms we can think of. And so because we're not seated in any one platform, we can look at all the different platforms. Um, and that will lead me directly to secondary infection um, as soon as I get my screen share set up. So this is a report that we published earlier this year, in, in June this year, on what we've called Operation Secondary Infection. It's named after the Soviet era Operation Infection, which was the, the libel that the United States had created the AIDS virus in a weapons lab, um, eerily similar to what we're now seeing with COVID. Secondary Infection was a collection of information operations 
on social media run from Russia by a central entity. We still don't know who that entity was. We know that it comes from Russia. We have a technical attribution from Facebook. We have all the supporting contextual evidence that you could ever want to say this is Russian, but we don't know which organization inside Russia is running this. And that's one of the big gaps in our knowledge. It started, in, for me, it started in about May last year when Facebook took down 21 accounts on its platform. Um, which it had attributed to this operation. And they came to us at, at the DFR lab and said, right, here's 21 accounts. Have a look, see what else you can find. Um, we've been publishing on it for over a year now, and I'll give you some of the highlights in this talk. But as, as we sit here right now, we've found over two and a half thousand pieces of content from this operation across more than 300 platforms. I was frankly amazed that there were that many platforms out there, but that we've got, I think 326 is the current number of secondary infection stories. So it's an enormous rambling operation. We call it a collection of information operations because it's been running for at least six years. The earliest posts we have were in Russian in January 2014, targeting the Russian operation. It was still running in April, May of this year uh, in English. And it's run over two and a half thousand articles. It's operated in at least seven languages. Um, so Russian, Ukrainian, English, French, German, Spanish, and Swedish. Um, over 300 platforms. And most of the accounts that it used were what we think of as single use burner accounts. So the typical pattern is that they would go onto, let's say Reddit, they would create an account on Reddit, they would post one story within maybe anything from one minute to one hour after creating that account, and they would never go back to that account again. They'd abandon the account, then they'd create another account, post another story, and keep on going that way. So the vast bulk of what they were doing, particularly from 2016 onwards, was using single-use burner accounts. Now, this meant that it was it actually became relatively easy to identify a secondary infection story once we'd found it, because you look at it and every single thing that's posted on it comes from a single use burner account. There's only one operation we know that does that, but it makes it much harder to actually find a story in the first place, because normally you'd use one account and you'd look at all the different things it's posted. You'd know that they all come from the operation. So that gives you a, a large corpus to work on. In this case, there's only one thing that this account posted. So it was a very high security, a very high secrecy operation in that sense. It also meant that because it was using a new account for everything that it posted, it really struggled to get viral engagement. There's one case where we know it got very large nationwide coverage, but mostly secondary infection did not actually do well at getting people to pay attention to it because it was burning its accounts as it used them. Over the course of six years, it posted on a lot of different subjects. The one it did most was attacking Ukraine. And this was the same across all languages. It was trying to claim that Ukraine was unreliable, aggressive, run by neo-Nazis, corrupt, kind of very like Russia is really, um, but it was very much attacking Ukraine. The next target was the United States slash NATO. So it would, and it would quite often conflate, conflate the two. Um, so the accusation would be that the US is trying to stir up a color revolution in Ar Armenia or Azerbaijan or Ukraine or any country around the, the, the Russian periphery. It posted a lot about how evil and divided and weak the, the European Union is, um, particularly around Brexit, but also around migration. Um, it attacked Kremlin cricket critics a lot. Its very earliest posts were targeting the Russian opposition way back in January 2014 before the Crimean operation started. Um, and it also, it attacks Angela Merkel, Theresa May, uh, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, it posted quite a lot about migration and Muslims. And then to some extent, it posted about elections. There was not so much content on elections, but in 2016, it was posting about the US election at the same time as the other op Russian operations we know. In early 2017, it was posting about the French ele election. 2018, it was posting about the Swedish election. So there was some election content. And from about late 2015 through to early 2018, when Russia was having its diplomatic row with Turkey, it attacked Turkey as well. So it was very much mapping onto Russian geopolitical narratives and geopolitical concerns. Um, Ukraine was the top country it posted about. 
this is a bit of an eye-watering graphic, so apologies for that. Um, the important thing to look out for is the, the darkest orange boxes are where you had the sudden surge in content. So if you look at the second line, the United States, you have a surge in early 2015, and then you've got a surge in Q2 and Q3 of 2016. That's when they're pushing out their election content. If you look at the UK, fifth line down, you've got a big surge in Q2, Q3 of 2018. That's just after Russia tried to poison Sergei Skripal in Salisbury, and the Brits were pushing back on the Russians. Uh, Ukraine, you can see they were they were pushing it the whole time. So that really shows you that they were they were tracking Russian concerns at the time. And particularly interesting, two thirds of the way down, you have the road for international organisations. That includes the World Anti-Doping Agency and the International Olympic Committee. There was almost nothing on them until the middle of 2016, and then suddenly there was a surge in content from secondary infection, infection targeting the IOC and the World Anti-Doping Agency, just when they were exposing all the systematic Russian doping. And that's very much the way secondary infection was working. If you think about, we know that Russian military intelligence targeted the World Anti-Doping Agency and the IOC. We know that the Internet, the Internet Research Agency targeted WADA and the IOC. Secondary infection was doing it at the same time. Same with targeting Hillary Clinton, same with targeting Emmanuel Macron. You, there's a very, very close mapping between what secondary infection was doing and what other known Russian operations were doing at the same time. Again, this is a bit eye-watering, but they also followed particular events in time. So back in 2014, when Russia invades Crimea, and then when it shoots down MH17 over Ukraine, secondary infection is talking about that. In 2018, after the poisoning of Sergei Skripal, secondary infection is attacking the UK. 2016, it's attacking Hillary Clinton. 2020, as coronavirus breaks out, you start getting secondary infection stories accusing the US of creating coronavirus in a weapons lab again. So they were watching what was going on in the world and particularly what was important to Russia. And then they were pivoting off it. I can share these slides if it helps. They're, they're, they're taken from the website. So, so I'm happy to share these afterwards to save everybody's eyesight. They were across over 300 different platforms. It wasn't primarily the ones you would think of. It wasn't mainly on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter. It was much more on second or third tier platforms like Medium, like WordPress, like Indie Media, like Quorum, Blogspot. And we think that's because they had made the assessment that those were easier platforms to create accounts on. Something we have seen over the last few years is the main platforms have got considerably better at looking for and taking down information operations, fake accounts, the kind of disinformation that I deal with. If you think about it, secondary infection was first exposed by Facebook when they had 21 accounts. <clears throat> so secondary infection seems to have made the decision, let's not go on the main platform so much, let's go where it's easier to operate. And they were treating these platforms as the soft underbelly of the internet, if you like. It's much easier to create a blog on Blogspot or WordPress, or I mean, there, there, are, there are websites they use that you don't even need to create an account, you can just post stuff. And, and so it, our impression is that they were looking for vulnerabilities in the system and they, they'd start laundering a story. Let's say they'd put it on WordPress first of all, then they'd put it on Quora, then they'd put it on Medium. And only at like the fourth or fifth iteration would they then post links on Facebook or Twitter. So they were using the big platforms as the, as the cherry on the cake, but the cake was somewhere else. And we think that was another way that they were trying to hide. They worked in a lot of languages. We found more posts in English than anything else, which is interesting. They started off in Russian, but they shifted to English and they stayed in English, particularly in 2016. German they built in a bit later. Spanish they tried, particularly around 2018. There were little bits in French and Swedish, um, but it was mainly English and Russian and quite a lot of German. A lot of this operation was focused on Germany and on Europe. And the, typically the way they would work would they they'd create a forged document from a high-level politician to another high-level politician. Uh, for example, from the German foreign minister to the Ukrainian foreign minister or from the European Commission to the German government. But each time they would create a forgery which made it look like some really dirty work was going on. You know, the Germans are trying to force the Poles to do something against their will, or the Poles are trying to force the Ukrainians to sell off their national industries, or the Ukrainians are about to sell out their country to neo-Nazis. And they would try and convince people that these forgeries were real 
and therefore spark a conflict between different countries. The problem was that they weren't very good at creating forgeries. Um, and one of my favorite cases was they, they created a letter which was allegedly from the Spanish foreign minister to um, the, the head of the parliamentary intelligence committee saying that British Remainers were about to assassinate Boris Johnson to try and stop Brexit, which is a great story. If people believe it, all kind of interesting things will happen. Um, but in this letter allegedly from the Spanish foreign minister, they couldn't even spell the minister's name in his signature block. And I will believe a lot of incompetence of bureaucrats, but misspelling the boss's name in his own signature block goes a little bit too far. So this was the kind of problem that they had in creating convincing content. The way they would work, they'd create a forged document, could be often a, typically a letter, it could be an interview, it could be a video, and they would post it from one persona on multiple different platforms on the same day. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you have posts from Medium, Scoop It, and the BuzzFeed forum, where they post a lot of this stuff. And you can see in the middle the shot just about, there's a forged letter that they've created in what purports to be Swedish, but not very accurate Swedish, which is saying that the UK is putting pressure on Sweden to confirm that Russia tried to poison Sergei Skripal when in fact, obviously it wasn't Russia. So you have a forgery. They created a persona called Peter Blom or Peter Bloms, and they posted on lots of different platforms at the same time on the same day in English. The following day, they've translated it into Spanish. They've created a new persona called Diago Rivas, and then they're posting that same is the, it's the same screenshot it's the same forged document but it's a spanish language translation of the english which they're then trying to push on a whole load of spanish language blogging forums then a few days after that they've created a new persona Dryshek Mikhail, uh, in ukrainian and again they've taken the spanish version they've translated it on into ukrainian they've kept the same screenshot and they're pushing it and in each case, what you're getting is that there's a, there's a laundering process that goes on. They create it in one language, they create the forgery, and then they try and move it through local language communities. And typically, this would be the way it worked. We'd, we'd find one particular story based on a fake. We'd start off by looking for where else that story crops up online. And we'd normally find it on five or six different platforms. And it always came from a single use burner account. You could then, we could then look for a copy of the, of the fake document and see where else that shows up. And normally that would lead us to more language ver versions. And again, they come from single use burner accounts. So it was a very systematic operation that was trying to launder its forgeries through different languages. A lot of the forgeries were apparently from America. So we had a fake letter of the US accusing the Ukrainians of uh, well, first, first of all, the US was illegally selling arms to Ukraine back in 2015, and then the Ukrainians were selling them on to Bashar al-Assad. So that was one of the, um, the early claims from this operation, but that, that's allegedly a letter from Tim Kaine to Mitch McConnell. Same kind of thing, you've got Senator Bob Corker warning that Ukraine is about to commit ethnic cleansing, trying to make Ukraine look bad. It looks like the same letterhead. Um, you've got Ron Wyden advising Senator Corker that, they, that the US should support an Islamic university in Saudi Arabia, which is a story that they were pushing in very anti-Islam parts of, parts of the web to show, look, the Americans are going to be training the next generation of jihadis. This one, they, um, they forged the signatures of the whole Foreign Affairs Committee, which was quite, quite daring of them. Uh, there's a tweet from Marco Rubio that they created. Now, this this is a, the way they created this. We think was they they photo they they took a screenshot of a real Rubio tweet, erased the text, and then just inserted their own text over the top of it. Um, this tweet never existed. It, nevertheless, it was reported by by RT Russia Today, Russian State TV, which was interesting. And two years on, they still haven't corrected it. But the idea behind this one seemed to be trying to get American conservatives outraged at the Brits for interfering in the 2018 midterms. And then you've even got John Kelly um, writing about a secret Syria plan with Turkey. So they, they cast their net far and, far and wide in their attempt to create forgeries. USAID plotting a revolution, kind of story they came up with a lot. 
the way they then worked it was that once they created these stories, then they would go to Twitter. So this is one of the accounts they were using in German, Katja Predius. And the, uh, the link that this account is sharing is a link which the operation itself created. It's a story that they posted online about the US and Poland conducting a secret war against Germany. But what this Twitter account is doing is it's directly at mentioning individual politicians from an opposition party and trying to get them to pay attention to it. So, so this has gone beyond just posting it on Medium and Quora and hoping that people will catch up on it. Here they're actually posting it directly to politicians and saying, you need to pay attention to this. And something we all need to think of going forward is we're going to see more and more on this in information operations. As it gets harder to run a big, a big network, we're seeing operations try to target individuals. So watch out for your Twitter mentions, watch out for your emails, because people will try and send it that way. The nice thing was that an awful lot of people actually recognized this stuff for what it was. It was, it was really encouraging to see how often the reactions to these blog posts were, what kind of idiot are you? Or in the case of this one here, that bottom comment, the translation of Swedish is, what kind of Putin troll wrote this? For, for every user who said, oh, wow, this is terrible, we should do something about it, you normally had at least one and normally more who said, this is just bogus, it's a fake. And it's really important when we're thinking about information operations to keep, keep the sense of perspective. Most of what secondary infection did died where it fell. Very few of its stories ever took on. The forgeries were incompetent. The, the accounts were single-use burner accounts, so they had no following and no friends. A lot of this stuff was out there on the internet, just sort of lying, rotting in corners until we found it. And so we reported on it back in May, June last year, because it was interesting, it was big, it was new. Uh, and it's important to keep an eye on. But at that stage, secondary infection was not an effective operation. It was using fake accounts to post fake stories about fake documents. It's not a very convincing combination. But what happened in October last year, so less than two months before the UK general election, genuine documents about US-UK trade talks got leaked online. The first page they showed up on was Reddit in English, uh, and they also showed up on a website called beforeitsnews.com, which is one that secondary infection used a lot. Now, this is 450 odd pages of readouts from the US UK trade talks, and they're genuine documents. They turned up not just in English, but a couple of days later, they turned up in German as well. Uh, on the left, you've got a, an Austrian local news website called meinbezirk.at. Uh, on the right, you've got German language Reddit. That screenshot on the right is important because you, if you can look closely, you can see that the account was created on the 23rd of October at 4.36 in the morning, and it posted its only story at 5.14, so less than an hour later. When I saw that, that rang all my alarm bells because meinbezirk.at is one of the sites that secondary infection used a lot, and it's a tiny local news site in Austria. The Reddit account was live for less than an hour. That was a single use burner account. You put those factors together and it looks like you've got secondary infection at work. But this time secondary infection was, was leaking real documents and they got picked up by Jeremy Corbyn during the election campaign. So the leader of the UK op opposition picked up on them because what then happened was you had Gregor Artio, so the same persona in English, starts tweeting them out to lots of different politicians. You can see that bottom tweet, he's tweeting the Labour Party, the Labour Department, the UK Labour Party press department and Labour MP John McDonnell. The top one, he's posting it to the Liberal Democrats. So here you have a newborn Twitter account, which is behaving in exactly the same way as that Katia Pridius account that I showed you earlier. It's the same behaviour pattern. And this time it works. A couple of weeks after those tweets, Jeremy Corbyn, unveiled at a campaign event what he said were the secret documents from the UK which explained what the UK was going to be do doing on trade talks with the with the US. This was a big story in the UK for a couple of days because Corbyn was saying that, that we were going to sell the health service which would not be a popular move here. But then we published 
that the way these leaks spread online exactly resembled secondary infection. And a few days later, Reddit confirmed it. This is before the election still. And we came out with the evidence that a Russian operation had just interfered in the UK general election before the election happened. And a couple of weeks ago, Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, finally confirmed that we were right. And that Russian actors, secondary infection, had almost certainly tried to interfere in the general election by dropping the trade leaks. It was Operation Secondary Infection. But what's really significant about this, and I will now drop back to actually being myself, if you think about what secondary infection did, for six years, it was posting fake stories from fake accounts and not getting any pickup because they were obvious forgeries. The one time it had a real slam dunk of a success was the one time it had genuine documents to play with. We now know that the, the documents were hacked from the, um, the private mailbox of Liam Fox, who was the trade secretary at the time. So they got, so classic mistake, right? A minister emails a work document to his home email so he can work on it at home, and then his home email gets hacked. And then that ends up in the hands of a Russian operation. We assume that the hackers were Russian. We don't have that confirmed at this point, but it's the likeliest outcome. And what, what was interesting in the election campaign was even when we had exposed that secondary infection interfered in the UK election, the UK Labour Party was still saying, but it's important what's in the documents. What's actually in the leaks matters. And that's a fair point of view. These are genuine documents which genuinely show that there was conversation going on about the status of the NHS in trade talks. It wasn't entirely the way Labour had presented it, but Labour were making the point that there's a public interest in leaking genuine documents. The Conservative Party was saying, yes, but it's really important that it came from a Russian operation. The real problem is that there's actually truth in both points of view. There was public interest in what would happen with the NHS in the trade talks. There still is. But there's also clearly a public interest in knowing that the Russians are interfering in our election. But that means that it's much more difficult than it is with a fake document with a forgery. If it's a forgery, you can tell the platforms to take it down, it shouldn't be there. And the platforms will get rid of it. If it's a genuine document, if it's a genuine leak, let's say one of the candidates in the 2020 US election gets his tax returns leaked. That's going to be a big story. If the government turns, or the, or the you know, if, whichever party, if they turn around to all the social platforms and say, you have to delete that off your platforms, that's censorship. It's going to be reported by all the media in the world. You can't take down the New York Times and the Fox News because they are amplifying something which is a genuine document. And so one of my big concerns going ahead to the 2020 election is we know there are operations like secondary infection out there not just from Russia, I've been studying Chinese ones a lot recently, Iranian ones as well. China, Russia and Iran all have highly developed hacking skills. How well are we prepared for dealing with a hack and leak operation? If it's genuine documents, what are the media going to do? What's civil society going to do? We can't just say make them go away. We have to find a way of providing context. So that's secondary infection in a nutshell and that's my thinking on one of the things that could happen this year. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your, your foresight on that. Um, I want to ask you, Ben, maybe I can start before opening it up to, uh, to all the other participants to ask their questions. And, and I will turn it over to Dan Mahaffey to, to manage that process in a moment. But um, I'm interested in your comments and wonder, I have a couple of, of things that are on my mind. One, one question I have for you is, were you able to measure the reach you mentioned you, you could see kind of where they posted certain articles and there are different platforms and if some of those reveal how many people watch certain pages were you able to analyze how, how wide the reach was of particular efforts to uh to get this so you know this this information out there and, and related to that were you able to do any kind of assessment of the effect i.e this drove that set of people to take some actions what, what was the kind of extent of your research into that that level so most of what we saw from this operation 
there was no indication that it had any actual impact at all. Uh, for example, on Reddit, you can measure various things, including the number of reactions that it gets from users. And typically, they would have zero reactions. If you're lucky, they get one or two. Um, okay. And particularly on Reddit, one of, one of the one of the policies that Reddit now has is that if you try to create an account and instantly post something, a lot of the different subreddits will just block you and say, hang on, your, your account is just too new. As an anti-spam measure, we are not going to let you post it until you've like posted stuff elsewhere. Um, and a lot of their stories were just taken down by the spam blockers. So most of what this operation did really didn't go anywhere. There were a couple of cases where, for example, in Germany, um, they forged an Arabic language or we were assuming they forged, somebody forged, and we assume it was this operation, an Arabic language pamphlet for Muslim refugees coming to Germany, telling them things like, you know, Germany will give you more social security money than anybody else, so here's how you get past Italy and Austria and Slovenia and get into Germany secretly. And when you're in Germany, here are the crimes that you can commit without getting deported. And here are the crimes you can commit, which will get you deported. So it's it's okay to commit mass sexual assault against women, but as long as you don't actually commit rape. Yeah, it's very clearly Muslim baiting, race baiting, trying to get the far right en enraged. And that particular pamphlet kept on cropping up on genuine German far right forums. So that's one way you can see that they had clearly fallen for it. And they believe that was the real thing. Um, we yeah. didn't see any indications of on-the-ground activity as a result of that. But I was certainly going around German chat sites, and I think were, that that particular story was picked up and rewritten by a German far-right magazine, and it had something like 15,000 views. Um, but that was, that was a rare exception. No, normally, all the indicators were that nobody even saw this stuff. The one time we know that they had a major impact on a live political debate was during the UK election. And that's where you, you had the leader of the opposition presenting at a formal press conference a leak that, unbeknownst to him, had come from secondary infection via Russian hackers. Hmm. I'm interested in your, in your thoughts on how, how much learning there is going on in this community of hackers or disinformation specialists, because it sounds uh, to some extent like you're describing a series of efforts which were not all that successful at least in not a, not in a measurable way or as you might have imagined but then and I'm also thinking a lot about as you have led us to think about this sort of context of the upcoming American elections and um, how prepared or unprepared we are to digest in a different way than we would have four years ago uh, efforts to sow dis dissent and let let's say let's assume for the purposes of the discussion that the the main goal of an operation is just to destabilize the u.s democracy not necessarily focusing on you know changing the outcome of the election but just to uh, create a denigration of faith in american democratic institutions and just put us on the back foot um, and, and i'm thinking about your description of the layering of creating a fake news story somewhere on three or four sources and then going to one or two other layers of platforms like Twitter to refer back to something else to create sort of a chain of legitimacy. I'm wondering how difficult you think, for example, it might be for a foreign actor to create a um, just barely fake looking U.S. electoral ballot and have somebody in a news story claim they found this in the mail and it's cl clear indication that, you know, there's a lot of fraud happening in mailing ballots. How, how, how far have we come since 2016 in your estimation of our vulnerability and in it vis-a-vis -vis the strength of these foreign actors, um, you know, based on what you've studied? So we, we've, in some ways, we collectively, and I kind of include myself as an honorary American at this point, um, we collectively have got a lot stronger. Um, but in some ways, we are actually weaker. Um, so it's a, it's a complex vulnerability set. On, on the plus side, you know, I, I was raising the alarm of Russian interference to the best of my ability back in 2016. And it took me until about October to get anybody to pay attention and actually publish me because there just there just wasn't the general understanding at that point that foreign interference was a thing that mattered 
the and partly everybody assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Partly the sheer scale of the social media operation hadn't yet come out. And whatever else you can say, this is not like that. There's, there's huge appetite and interest. The platforms, and I'm thinking particularly the big three, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, have done a lot of work on information operations. Yeah. To start with, accepting that these things are real and can be a problem. Which again, if you think back to 2016, Zuckerberg was saying you'd have to be crazy to think that fake news on my platform made a difference. Mm -hmm. That's gone. That that complacency has gone. And around the platforms, you have a whole community of you know groups like mine, whose job is rooting out that kind of stuff. So between everything the platforms have done, between the kind of stuff we've done, it's getting harder for operations to run large scale convincing high audience operations. You can do a really small scale one, which is convincing. Like you can create one persona and try to develop it and hope that that will go well. You can go very large scale and spammy, uh, which is what I've seen China doing more recently, but it's spam. You're not gonna get much attention paid to it. But if you're gonna try and run a large number of convincing individual accounts from a single central control point, you're gonna go down. There's, there's too many people looking for it now. So on the plus side, our defense is a lot stronger and journalists, some journalists understand this much more, that there's a much greater awareness. The danger is really that, yeah, America is even more polarized than back in 2016. And the great problem that I see is that, you know, you, you talk about creating distrust and creating a lack of belief in, in the system. And I think that, that's right and that's a big danger. But you've already got the situation where half the American electorate by default has zero trust in the other half and is therefore preconditioned to believe practically anything about the other side. The, the, you know, particularly on the extremes of both sides, it would be quite hard, I think, at this point to make up a fake story about the other extreme of the other partisan group that people wouldn't actually believe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a that's a vulnerability because it would make it easier to run a false flag attack. You, you know, you, you wouldn't need to, let's say for the sake of argument, be an, a Russian actor running a hundred fake Black Lives Matter accounts like they did back in 2016. You just need to claim that you did. And there will be people on the other side, on, on the far right, who will jump on it and will therefore use it to sort of dismiss the whole BLM movement and probably the other way around as well. You could get a Russian operator saying, hey, I am actually half of the accounts on the alt-right. The far left will, will go nuts. And so there's, there's a, it's a different vulnerability set this time around. And it's really rooted in that extreme distrust that you have at the two poles, which means for our job, one of the things we're going to have to calibrate really carefully is how we communicate. And, and something I sometimes get into trouble with with, with my colleagues is... I kind of undersell the stuff that we're finding because I'm saying, look, you know, we found a secondary infection. Yeah, it's absolutely huge, but almost nothing had an impact. And quite a lot of journalists say, look, you're killing the story. You're saying it didn't have an impact. It's like, sorry, but it didn't have an impact. And I'm going to say that, but we have to be really careful when we're pointing at, you know, if we find a network, there's always this temptation. If you're the one to find, who found it to get very excited and say, wow, look how big this is. And you've really got to actually sit back and say, yeah, but, Sure, it's across 300 platforms, but it's total readership is me. That's not actually probably even something worth reporting. Yeah, no, I appreciate the honesty there, but the, I think you've, you've kind of helped us understand that the challenge here is that uh, the offense has an advantage when they only need to have one thrown match land on the tinderbox. And we have to try to, you know, root out all of them and, and expose them and, and get people to want to understand them as they are instead of to see them in a light which may be uh, beneficial to a very, to a short-term political argument that you've already undertaken. Um, thanks, Ben. Let, let me, I, know, I can see that we've already got some questions coming in. So I do want to turn it over to uh, Dan to field some of those questions. But let me just remind all of our participants, um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can type it in under the Q&A button, or if you press participants and uh, raise your digital hand if you want to uh, be recognized live and, and ask the question yourself. All right, Dan, let me, um, let me turn it over to you. Go ahead and let's uh, start to take some of these questions for Ben. 
Great. And the, Ben, the first question I have here follows up on the what you've just said about impact. And uh, the question is interestingly written saying, if they had a PowerPoint slide deck that they were bragging about their accomplishments, uh, what do you think it would say? That's a wonderful question. And, and one of the things, particularly with secondary infection, we, we kept on coming back to was what do these guys think they're doing? Because in, in many ways they were, I mean, I sometimes wondered if this was a punishment detail, right? You haven't been good enough at the troll farm. So now you've, you know, you've got to send a story viral, but you're only allowed to use each, oper each, each asset once. And you're not allowed to write in competent English and you've only got a dodgy forgery. To, I mean, it's, it's almost like Sisyphus in hell, right? Um, but I, and, and we don't know the answer. Um, a couple of points on secondary infection and particularly one of the theories is that it was a training operation. It was teaching people how do you create burner accounts, how do you operate on all these different platforms. You don't really care so much about the content that they're producing, you're teaching them the approach. That, that's one theory. Another one is that they were working the budget, which is a very Russian thing. You, know, you have to produce five stories per week, okay? Here's our five stories. Um, if their boss is particularly not tech savvy, you can actually say, look, we posted it on Medium and here it is on Quora and Reddit and all these other ones. We've done really well. It's like, yeah, but you've posted it yourself. So, so we don't know about that. Um, but there are, there are big differences between the different operations. So we know that the Internet Research Agency was obsessed with metrics. Um, they would A, B test different. They do like two slightly different variants of the same post and see which one worked better. Um, from what I remember reading like the internal troll factory files, they got bonuses if they got some, more than a certain amount of impact. They were very good at getting picked up by the mainstream media. So the internet research agency was a very different beast. Uh, there's a Chinese operation that we uncovered last year called Spamouflage Dragon, which is massively spammy, hundreds and hundreds of accounts, mainly on YouTube um, and then amplified on Facebook and Twitter where it looks like every single post has maybe 50 responses, but the more you dig into it, the more you realize that every one of those responses comes from the operation. And so there it looks like they're trying to make it look like their numbers are convincing. Again, we don't know is that trying to prove to the boss that they've done good work, or is it trying to make it look more attractive to real users? On a lot of this, we, we, we kind of have to draw the best conclusion we can from in incomplete information. And it could be that there are other metrics that they're looking at that we don't know about. In the sort of contradictory sense or devil's advocate viewpoint here from one of the questioners, uh, would democracies uh, benefit from more of these hack and leak operations that provide uh, information of public interest, even if it is coming from a, uh, a foreign government targeting the country? I mean, that, that's the really problematic question, because if it's a genuine document, then there may be a public interest in it. Um, and there, there are a couple of challenges there. You know, I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, leaks play a part in politics. They always have, they always will. Sometimes those are weaponized leaks. I mean, I seem to remember that the US joined the First World War because of stuff that the Brits leaked at the right moment, right? But it was genuine stuff. So there is a real impact from that. But... A lot of it comes down to the context and the way that it's reported, because there, you know, there is a difference between a disgruntled employee handing over a document from the institution where he works and Russian hackers breaking in, stealing it and weaponizing it at the moment of their choosing. Because what they are trying to do is somehow swing the election debate. They tried it in the UK and it didn't work. So there are a couple of things which are realistically important to do one is that if somebody comes out with a leaked document ask where the leak came from and sure if it's a journalist they're not going to tell you what their source is but at least you need to hammer on the question do you know who the leaker was do you know how it got out there if it turns out of all then that needs to be reported up it's not just here's how the leak what's in the leak but here's how it got out there and in fact, the reason that um, one of the reasons that I managed to expose secondary infection before the UK election was that other journalists had correctly started asking that question. How did the documents end up in Jeremy Corbyn's hands? Various journalists dug and found it started on Reddit. So putting that context there is really important. And also more for the, for the media, asking the question whether it's actually newsworthy. Because something we saw back in 2016 with the Clinton or the Podesta leaks, 
so many of them were just routine. There was no actual story there, but journalists were covering them because other journalists were covering them. Everybody had to have their Podesta story. And so they built this meta image of corruption and untrustworthiness and you know, all the emails and stuff. When actually it's like, guys, he's ordering pizza. So what? And so, so yes, there can be a public interest in leaked documents, but part of the conversation needs to be, is it really interesting? You know, if it's the president's tax returns, I think, you know, any outfit in the country would bite off your arm to have them and loads of people will want to read them. If it's what the president had for breakfast, why is that a story? So, so I think you're right. It's, it, it's, it's a nuanced conversation. It's not an easy one. But the things that you have to have in there are the context of how did this stuff get out into the public domain? Or, or how, not even how did it get into the public domain? How did it leave the private domain in the first place? And then is it actually newsworthy? I think it describes a, a, that journalists have to provide more context for how they got the information or a, a warning label, for lack of a better term. Uh, but with the um, follow-on question here, too, where I see uh, recent events with FireEye unmasking the Ghostwriter campaign, do you uh, see any connections? Have you identified any between that and secondary infection? Only a very slight one. So, so one of the odd things is that there's, there's a couple of stories out there which look very like secondary infection productions, which came out at exa almost exactly the same time. And it almost felt like there was this sort of concerted attack on Poland and Lithuania particularly, all in, I think it was the very end of April, about the 20th of April. So the, the timing is weird, but it, once you drill down beyond that, there are a lot of differences, starting from the fact that the Polish stuff and the Lithuanian stuff was in Polish and Lithuania. Those are not languages that we've seen secondary infection work in before. There was hacking and defacing of websites, which is not something we've seen secondary infection do before. Um, the con I mean, the context fit, the, 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 the overall style and accusing NATO of spreading disease around Poland, Lithuania. Yeah, bang on. That's exactly the kind of thing that secondary infection does all the time. So that there are resemblances, but, but in the detail of the TTPs, there are a lot of differences. And so... I, I looked at the Polish and Lithuanian stories way back when they actually happened, and my feeling was, yeah, this, this doesn't feel like our guys. And then there's a couple of stories that came out which felt much more like them. It would be really nice at this point if we knew who was actually behind secondary infection, because it, it almost feels like what you might have is two units within a bigger system, which have been working in parallel but are actually starting to coalesce around the same targets. It could be they've been ordered to do the same thing at the same time. It could be that they're actually starting to cooperate a bit more. We're not sure, but, but some of the key elements of Ghostwriter, like the hack and deface, is not something we've ever seen in six years of secondary infection. So it feels, it feels substantially different. One of the questions asked if this methodology, perhaps going to the lower tier websites or laundering it as you show in your, uh, presentation, was it designed to flummox the higher level social, social media filters that Facebook and Twitter had put in in response to 2016? Yeah, I think it, uh, I, yes, I, I think it could be. I mean, one, one of the interesting things we saw was that secondary infection changed its style quite a lot in sort of June, July 2016. And we, we don't know why, um, but it was very much around the time that Russian military intelligence was hacking and leaking. It's secondary, so between kind of late 2014 and mid 2016, secondary infection actually ran half a dozen personas which were regularly on under the same name on WordPress and Blogspot and Twitter and Facebook. Um, and it looked like they were trying to create at least semi believable characters. And they dropped them all between June and July 2016. For, for unclear reasons. And from then on, they were obsessively using single use burner accounts. And a lot of the time they were staying off the main platforms. I, th I think you're right. I think that was, I think what, what they wanted was a URL that they could then build everything else off. Because what, one of the interesting things is that they, they particularly liked CNN iReport back in the day, which was like the CNN crowdsourced, anyone could write anything. Um, and the BuzzFeed community, 
which has a buzzfeed.co.uk URL, but that's not the same as buzzfeednews.com. But it's a URL with BuzzFeed in it. And there were a few times where they'd post a story on the BuzzFeed community and then they'd run stories elsewhere saying, look what BuzzFeed says. So I think it was partly to, to generate a URL which they can use elsewhere and partly for the big platforms. If you're sharing an article, you're not actually putting your own content there. So you're sending up less of a flag. So I think it was a combination of those things. This was always a very, very defensively geared operation. The, the single use burner accounts mean you're almost never going to get a viral impact, but it's going to make it really hard for any kind of investigator to work out how big your operation actually was. And I think using the small platforms was probably part of that. You put stuff where the big platforms aren't going to see it and you kind of let it mature there. And then you post it on the main platforms at a later stage. One of the questions here talks as you acknowledge that we still have vulnerabilities, but as we become more aware, uh, governments, major platforms, and I'll add to this question, I think even individuals to borrow from the parlance of the, of the time, immunity in a sense to uh, misinformation grows. Uh, how do how do you think that will uh, that impact is affected by our awareness of this? So it makes it makes it difficult. I think it's it's going to be difficult for anyone to run the kind of operation that we saw the IRA do back in 2016, where they you know they were running quite a large number of very vocal, very high profile accounts which were linked on the back end. I mean, some of them even had Russian phone numbers. It was it was crazy stuff they got away with back then. I think that is harder, but you know, you see from secondary infection in, in October, November last year, they managed to fundamentally change the dynamic of the whole election debate for 48 hours. And it would have lasted longer if we hadn't exposed it by that combination of, of hacking and leaking, but leaking online in a way that we'd already recognized. So I, th I think the way I would characterize it in you know, if this was a, a football game or a rugby match, back in 2016, only one team was actually on the field. They had it so easy. I mean, they, they created an account called Tennessee GOP, which was pretending to be the Republican Party in the Tennessee, and they registered it to a Russian mobile phone number. And it lasted for a year and a half. I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff looking back on it. That would not happen again. But, you know, we saw from secondary infection that as of... October, November last year, there was effective interference in the UK's general election, different way of doing it. And something which we're likely to see more of is rather than this kind of very public IRA style trolling, we'll get more direct messaging of influencers, more attempts to land a story in front of journalists. We've seen various like Iranian operations, for example, building up fake journalist personas so that they can then plant their stories, not so much in the, in the top tier publications, but like one or two tiers down. So there's still that. And in terms of impact, it's unpredictable, but two really important features in impact are journalists and politicians. We've seen many occasions where a, you know, a journalist who's in a hurry or a politician who has a point to make has picked up content directly from an information operation and put it in front of an audience of millions. I mean, in, in Classic example in 2016, there, there was a, a US academic who had decided that Google was rigging its auto results in favor of Hillary Clinton on the basis of no scientific evidence. Um, he wrote a 5,000 word article on Sputnik, right? Kremlin control outlet, saying Google is messing with the election and it's favoring Clinton. That was then picked up by Infowars, which got picked up by Breitbart, which got picked up by Fox News, which got picked up in a speech by a chap called Donald Trump. So you've gone from a Russian information operation based on, frankly, somebody well-meaning but, but unscientific, all the way to a president in the space of 10 days. And at that point, all the major newspapers had to do an article on what is Trump saying about Google and auto results and, and why is he talking about it? And you've got an audience of millions that's a massive impact and it starts from a very small place. So it's the kind of thing where it'll be harder for operations to do the kind of thing that the IRA did back in 2016, but the operators are out there and they're watching and they're learning and they're more likely to try direct targeting of journalists and politicians to try and get their stories through. 
Uh, looking at the clock, I think this will probably be our final question. So uh, uh, Ambassador Tom Pickering, our, our chairman, has asked, uh, beyond secondary infection, what was Russia's greatest success in influencing the, the 2018 elections? And if I may add to that, since we're, we're getting to the end here, after what you saw with 2018, what do you think we need to be aware of in, in 2020 as we, uh, as we approach November? Sure. So, I mean, two very nice questions. So in 2018, what was interesting was how badly they did, um, but not because they were playing bad offense, it's because we were actually playing good defense. On the Sunday night before the midterms, the FBI tipped off Facebook and Twitter that they had identified Russian interference on platform. The platforms took it down and published it within 24 hours. Within 48 hours, the analyst community, you know, guys like me, had already analyzed what we found. So before, you know, be between the Sunday night and the Tuesday election, all that machinery had kicked into motion and the IRA was left without any effective assets. At that point, they tried to pretend that they'd always meant to do that and they'd already interfered with the election, but they, they were ham-fisted about it. That was really a case where, where things, where the defense actually worked well. Um, in terms of the election this year, there's a couple of things I'm worried about. One is still Hack and Leak. That, that's gonna have the biggest payoff for any threat actor. One is the number of threat actors who are out there. We know Iran has been experimenting with this stuff for longer than Russia has. China is getting more and more aggressive. They each have their own preferences. They're not as clear cut as Russia's are. But there are, there are, and there's all the domestic chaos going on. Um, and then the other problem is that even more than in 2016, one of the biggest targets of disinformation this time is going to be the election itself not the outcome and not either candidate, but just the way the thing is run. And the problem is that that therefore gives a threat actor far more things to attack. They can launch disinformation about the candidates or they can launch disinformation about the social media platforms or about the electoral bodies or about the postal service, or they can run stories on the day saying, look, here is electoral you know, ballot box stuffing or busing people in to vote or people voting five times or bias on the part of election, you know, just, just the polling stations, right? There are so many different things they can attack. And added to that, because of COVID and because of the, the situation with postal voting, the assumption now is that we're not going to find out on the 3rd of November. We're probably not going to find out for days or weeks afterwards. And so there's much more time for threat actors to try and attack the election. And the kind of thing you could potentially get, I mean, we're, we're very, very hypothetical now, but what happens if somebody puts out a video between when the polls close and the results come out saying here are election staff in a polling station changing the results or here are election staff it's only audio and it's discussing changing the results or it decides that which candidate they hate or there's so many different variants but but what it means is that the the period of uncertainty is going to be longer than usual we're in this polarized situation where whoever wins, there's going to be a lot of losers who think they were robbed. Losers in the sense of people who lost, who lost not any kind of pejorative there. People will want to believe that they were robbed and therefore they will want to believe anything that validates that. And so you'll have a very receptive audience for that kind of disinformation. So I think actually the, the biggest target is really the credibility of the way this process is being run. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much for uh, your, your time and responses. Uh, Glenn, I'll turn it over to you. Let me just uh, repeat what Dan said and say thank you, Ben, for joining us uh, from overseas and thank you for your work on this topic. It's obviously one of, of great importance to us, not just the learning of the detail, but the, um, the helping, of, helping us to understand what role we need to play in our awareness of this and, and to keep this uh, this story um, being reported so that we can learn something and hopefully the US, the UK, Western democracies can do a better job at um, being agile and defending against these types of operations. I, I think clearly the, the very success of our democracies uh, requires us to get better at this and you're playing a key role in helping us do that. So I just, I want to thank you again, Ben, for your, for doing that and for sharing your time with us and sharing your your expertise and your findings with us today. So uh, thank you on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress to you and to all of our 
uh, participants for joining us today. Um, everybody be well and we'll see you soon. Thanks very much. Stay Take safe. Care. Bye.